represent uh, Kelly Doran from Mass Design Group. And uh, I think you will introduce yourself, right? Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm on a tight leash here, so I'm going to like <laughs> cord myself up in the corner. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Uh, kind of last minute, I was coming up for some meetings with White today and uh, found, found my way into your agenda. So thank you for the opportunity, uh, uh, Sega, for making this happen. Um, I'm with Mass. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of us before. Hand, show of hands. Okay, a few people. Good stuff. Um, we, uh, we, we started about 10 years ago in Rwanda. I uh, started by a couple of people that were still in public school. And, uh, our founder actually did his, PhD, uh, did his master's thesis on Giancarlo de Carlo. Uh, and he's, his work is, is really a kind of the touchstone of, of our kind of ethical background. Um, a kind of unknown player in Team 10. And I think this quote from him really resonates with me as far as like what we're trying to do as an architecture firm or as architects broadly. So that, that we're really about processes and, 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 and at this point, this is 40 years ago, and I, I kind of reread this quote uh, quite often, and it always strikes me that 40 years later, what he said is still pressing, if not more so. It's kind of a word of warning that architects are completely more and more narrowing their scope of work uh, to really not really service the entire process of building. And on the other uh, part of this, I'd say my anti-hero would be Patrick Schumacher, um, where you know this quote, which got him in some trouble arguably a couple of years ago, you know, talking about the role of architects and how dare we think about social justice, how dare, you know, this is not our purview, this is not what we're to do. And, and I, I, looking at my education, graduating uh, about 10 years ago, and thinking about the pedagogy of when I was in school was very much about form, and that's kind of bolded this. So I think this move, of, like critical for us as a, as a discipline, uh, is, is finding ourselves back into, um, you know, the large processes of building, and I think really, Understanding how we need to advocate for ourselves uh, as well. I think we've we've done well to marginalize ourselves as a as a profession. Um, so you know the question that, that we're trying to ask is how can architects better communicate? How can we advocate for ourselves? How do we involve ourselves in a wider spectrum of this process of building and not just thinking about ourselves as designers? So you know how how we're doing this. I think we're beginning to chip away as a discipline. You know, we're doing things like LEED, I'm sure there's an equivalent here in Sweden, where we say, our oh, building is, is sustainable, great, it's, it's gold sustainable, it's platinum. And this is a way to actually measure and prove that, that we're having an effect on something. You know, you fill out, you, box, you tick a few boxes, you grade yourself, and, and you end up with one of these. And, and we're thinking, okay, this is, this is perhaps a useful lens to begin to, like, this is a way for us to advocate for our role, but you know, we're like, what are all the what are all the various ways that we're doing this as a discipline, um, and and how do those line up and actually what buildings seek to achieve? You know, why are we why are we putting buildings in the world? You know, all of them have, you know, all of them have very easy things that we can measure. Like we didn't, we're not building an architecture school to be sustainable. That's not its purpose. We're building an architecture school. We're renovating an architecture school to improve the quality of architectural education. That would be the mission statement. It's environmental performance is a kind of, you know, part of, of that education, but it's not core to it. So we, we think about that as the mission of a project, and, and how can that mission also have a systemic impact? How could the renovation of an architecture school affect the design of not just architectural schools, but all postgraduate education, right? Um, and then back to his quote there, so, you know, I think right now, you know, where we look at ourselves as designers in this kind of narrow strip, really trying to think about the entire process and how we can engage that more actively. So that's why we started MAPS 10 years ago. Um, uh, our, our kind of mission statement is thus, that, that architecture is not a neutral profession. It is either, it either has benefit or not, it heals or it hurts. It's those two things. And, and uh, our mission as an organization is to research, to build, and to advocate for an architecture that provides, uh, promotes justice and dignity for the people that build it and that occupy it. Um, and that we, we, we seek to work with organizations and, and individuals that have that shared approach. Um, we're a nonprofit. I think the first question everybody asks us is what's a nonprofit architecture firm? Um, this is what it is. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we're you know, a pretty big organization, about 100 people now. Um, across uh, across our five offices, 
And um, I, the nonprofit part, if you can understand the typical business model of architecture, um, I can't really cross here, but you know, the gray is the standard fee structure. You know, you make most of your money through divine, design development, construction documents, and a bit over construction, and you know, that ebb and flow of how we, how we make our money. You know, what we've done is the green part is our nonprofit status. It's allowed us to raise some funds and to do things more upfront that we ordinarily people would not pay architects to do. Or ordinarily, as our board member would say, without mass, would that project happen? So we bring money to a situation, to a context, to enable, to enable people to access design that otherwise might not afford it. Um, throughout the project, we, we have a fellowship program, so we take people on and train them uh, and, and give them job opportunities to help build up their team. And at the end, we're doing a lot of grant applications to do research and post-occupancy type of analysis of our projects to actually, you know, prove that, like, test out the hypothesis. Did this building reduce uh, maternal mortality, for instance? Um, that catalyst fund is, you know, just some of the you know, the fundraising that we do and, and how we, you know, people that we've, people that we've worked with, you know, kind of like thought leaders in, in, in and I'll show a project in Alabama about that later, parts of the world that don't have access to, to architects. We're currently in Liberia, we're the 11th registered architect in Liberia. When we started in Rwanda, we were the seventh architect in a country of 11 million people. So, you know, we're entering markets that are the complete dearth of, of, of designers and, and engineers. And, and things like the type of, you know, research that we want to do. Uh, research into healthcare. Right now we're looking at research, uh, most of our research in the United States is focused around incarceration. Um, something that this part of the world does a lot better than the United States. Some of the partners that we're working with across the world, some ministries of health, uh, NGOs, um, uh, a law, a law nonprofit, equal justice initiatives. And, and our, where our team is. I'm this one person in London, and our we started in Rwanda and in, in, in Boston, and we've slowly been kind of filtering out from there our work. Um, our work is kind of get, getting recognition uh, internationally, so it's our project in Haiti, uh, getting to the Times, and this last year, our, I'll show this project in a little while, our, our memorial uh, in Alabama um, has really helped us uh, kind of um, establish ourselves in the United States. This is my boss Michael in his TED talk last year. I encourage you to, to go look at it if you hadn't uh, seen it already. He's a better, better speaker than me. Um, and uh, some of the awards that we've been getting over the last couple of years uh, in the United States primarily. And a lot of the research that we're trying to push out, it isn't in the architectural magazines, it's in journals. Uh, married to a scientist, this is how you get legitimate. This is how you get your work in front of the doctors. You know, get, go speak their language and get yourself published in, in the places that they're, the magazines and the journals that they read. Um, our, our kind of like, uh, how we work is, it's around this, uh, this idea of impact design and, and we've worked to, to modify a few uh, impact design methodologies to our own, this IDM as we call it. And we ask these four questions of every project with our partners. What's its mission? What's that kind of, what's the broad statement this project is looking to do? Uh, how are you going to get there? How are you going to achieve those things? What impacts is it going to make? And how can you measure those? Like, uh, for instance, at this NICU meeting last Thursday, they really want to bring parents into maternal care more often, a neonatal intensive care unit. And it's like one impact metric would be how many diapers were changed by parents. You know, something you can measure that would prove your design is going up or down. And the last thing, the last thing is systemic. How can this design impact the way people think about that type of a building or that type of a problem? And it's an iterative thing. So as you work through this, it kind of comes back on itself. You change your mission statement. And you iterate it over and over again. But this really, what it's done is, is uh, kind of framed the way we approach design. And for me, when I first brought, came to Mass, it was like, you know, it's like this is this is great. We can all have like have a thesis that you can like live with. And if there's ever a question about a design decision, it's never some subjective. Well, I thought it was cool, but it's like, no, this will. That's why, you know. Um, so it gives you kind of background. So I'll show a few projects through that lens. And so the first is this, this idea of mission, this simple idea, easily transmissible. One sentence that explains a project. Um, and we'll start with the project we got started 10 years ago. So we were invited to Rwanda uh, with, uh, with partners in health who, who were providing, uh, uh, we're working with the Ministry of Health there, and so we, we got asked to build a hospital and you know, come and help us. Okay. Um, this is where Rwanda is, if you don't know Africa, it's the little country in the middle of Burundi. 
um, within Rwanda, Kigali is the capital city, and, and Butaro, the, where the hospital is up, up in the nor northwest and the volcanoes go, it's the like, most beautiful part of the world. Um, we started, there's the district, 400,000 people, no doctors. So simply building a hospital is going to change things. Um, and and uh, But beyond that was uh, you know, the people that were bringing help to us. So this is Dr. Farmer who brought us there, and also Dr. Agnes, uh, who was the Minister of Health at the time. And we basically sat around the table with them for two years, designing the hospital with these doctors, walking the hillside, figuring out there's not a lot of precedent here. How do we build a hospital in, in this part of the world? You know, at the contemporary, about the same time that we were starting, this project had been, in the public health world, had uh, been getting a lot of attention for the wrong reasons. So this is a recently pro uh, finished project in Lesotho, um, uh, not South Africa, to go to the ferry, and there's a tuberculosis outbreak in this hospital because of that room. So people with TB uh, or not were coming to this hospital and were in this waiting room. And if you can make out that image, this is the, the worst possible design you could ever have for an infectious disease. So people not only were coming to the hospital with TB and getting sicker, people that were healthy were coming, were getting TB. In this case, the architecture was literally killing people. So this is how not to design a hospital. This, on the other hand, if you go back 150 years ago with Florence Nightingale, seeing things on the left, these are the original tents where the soldiers were treated. Recovery rates were abhorrent, no, no natural ventilation. People, again, paired in a tent, tended to die faster. They would have done better not in the tent. Architecture's killing people. Nightingale comes along and says, wait a minute, like, I understand this is an airborne disease. Let's get them into big, light, you know, airy rooms. That move, like, changed the way healthcare was delivered. Um, you know, going to see this in a couple weeks, I can't wait, but, you know, fast forward 50 years, this, this idea about landscape, outdoor, air, light, and how it had, like, impacts on people's, you know, experience of healthcare and their recovery times uh, is there. But yet, you know, since, say, since Nightingale, since Alto, the last 50 years, we've been painting ourselves into a box with healthcare. So we did a kind of, like, study of, like, the kind of typology of healthcare, and I would say most healthcare currently exists in this box. A big square with a bunch of things in the middle, a bunch of people that work all day that don't see light, um, and windows that don't open. You know, this is where we've arrived as a healthcare profession. So in Butaro, where we have no electricity most of the time, where there's very little running water, you can't you can't go to the box mode. So we went back to Alto, we went back to Nightingale. All the exterior, all the circulation's exterior, all the windows open, all the rooms are naturally ventilated. Simple decisions about. Uh, instead of the beds facing each other, like Nightingale, have them face out so that they see the landscape, that they're engaging the beautiful place that they're in. But also, you only have electrical and medical glasses in one wall instead of two. You're making things easier. Um, uh, the building itself, when we came to design it, was, you know, very low budget. We said, like, okay, what's going to make this, be this project built, uh, beautiful and, and distinguished? And we landed on this, this local stone, which this farmer, and you walk around this part of Rwanda, Lava rock is just coming out of the soil, and they pile it on the side as a nuisance. And we saw, hey, great! There's this amazing pumice just for free, just sitting here. Why don't we, you know, use that? Materials, the things that's expensive. Labor is the thing that's that's inexpensive. It's the inverse of a northern hemisphere uh, quotient. So, you know, employ as many people as possible and use the free material, and and that's what we did here. Um, this again, this got us some kind of got us below the fold in the Times. You know, hospital in Rwanda could teach us something about healthcare. I mean, this is like, it's funny because we're just going back to first principles. We're going back to what made sense then. And that's coming back to us. Uh, on the success of this hospital, Partners in Health quickly said, hey, we've got doctors from all over the world wanting to come and work here, but we don't have any, anywhere for them to stay. So we did some housing. Um, uh, this part of the world had zero cancer treatment uh, facilities at all. So the next project, they said, oh great, we've got a funder that wants to open an oncology treatment center. You know, part of the world, it, it just the absolute, again, discrepancy between where there is service and the people that need it. So we did a, a, a center for, uh, for oncology treatment. And we're currently building, uh, this is uh, just topped off, uh, a hospice, a, a, ho a hotel for people that are coming from as far as South Sudan for treatment with their caregivers to, to stay while they're getting treated. Um, across the hill, and this is the kind of snowball effect, so the, 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 the hospitals there, the, the housings here, 
And we just completed a whole university of, of uh, called the University of Global Health Equity. Uh, again, with partners in health, they're now starting, basically they want to be the Oxford of Africa. And it's on the hillside across from the hospital, and you can see the volcano in the distance. So this momentum, you know, pretty quickly uh, brought us into discussions. We, we had this relationship with the minister. She said, great, you did one, I need 29 more. Like, okay, well, we can't, we can't design 29. We'll, what we'll do is we'll give you the kind of DNA, the blueprint, the, the standards for this. So we did these typical plans. Uh, the first project I was engaged with with Mass, where you understand the basic DNA of a 300-bed district hospital and, and handed them a document that wasn't a kind of like rubber stamp to put around the countryside, but something that their infrastructure team could use to, to help scrutinize projects that came in plan new ones and, and demand more of the architects and engineers that they were that they were working with. So we went through floor by floor and gave kind of critical dimensions, notes and like where things are like, you need to do this because of this. This is a health outcome and this is related to that. Um, that then they said, can you test drive this? Uh, okay, great. So uh, first first project, uh, my first project on the ground was Munini District Hospital. This is uh, currently in construction. This is similar to uh, Butaro, very rural, very poor uh, part of Rwanda, and again, uh, one of these amazing sites. There's no bad site in the country. Um, and then they were like, great, do it again in the city this time. So we did one in, yeah, this is downtown Kigali, uh, and they're both kind of racing each other right now to the ground, and this is a kind of view, as you can see, of, of Kigali. Um, <laughs> shift gears a bit onto that kind of second part of that is, is the method. So how, how we do things. Um, and I think that's where the volume needs to come in here. This school in the, in the middle of Congo, you can kind of get it uh, from this. We, we made a documentary about this movie. We sent one of our architects and his, his wife, who became a filmmaker, into the jungle for a year and a half uh, to build the school. Um, the most extreme project I could ever imagine. Uh, so this is the school in the context, dead center of Congo. Um, when we got there, this is what a school looked like. So this, you're traveling through this part of the world, this one had a roof, which is an improvement on the one before it. Um, so to, to get there, uh, it's hard. You, you fly to Kinshasa, you, uh, you, if, you, if you're lucky, you take a chartered flight up to Mbandaka. From there, you can go to Mpono on a boat. And then to, to, to get from there on barge, to get to Lima, you basically are on the back of a bicycle or a motorcycle. It's a four-hour motorcycle ride from the nearest in Jolu is a grass landing strip, again, if, you're, if you can afford the charter to fly into there. So from a site, this comes with a lot of constraint. You know, How are you going to bring materials into a site that has to come on a motorcycle and, and the road is as wide as my shoulders in many places? So it makes a host of decisions for you right away. So we went and we spent about two weeks uh, just trying to figure out what's there, who makes stuff, uh, what, what capacity exists in, in this part of the world? What materials are there? What kind of species of wood is there? What are the bricks made out of, right? Like, we went and collected a bunch of stuff, brought them back and took them to a lab and did a bunch of material testing. Uh, what kind of crafts are, are there? So kind of weaving, you know, what are the, what are the existing, what's the existing palette, not just material, but labor? Um, and, 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 and started to put together a very simple matrix uh, that explained 
we source this, this is where it comes from, and, and really thinking about how we're making decisions around what the building is going to be constituted from. So, um, you know, in the end, we, uh, we, as you can see, I think that one of the materials that we featured was wood shingles, which seems so, like, just obvious. Um, but what we found is a species of wood in the jungle that uh, was very much like cedar, had the same kind of tannins, physical properties, so that it could gray and age. And we did this because you can't bring metal roofing in, and if the roof ever had a leak and you needed to replace it, it takes two months to get a sheet, if you're lucky, from Kinshasa. This case, we taught them how to make a shingle, so not only could they maintain the building, they could then take the draft to the rest of the, of the village. The weavers, kind of rattan, uh, doors and windows of beautiful hardwoods, you know, uh, taken from the site. Uh, and, I, and the building was built of, of mud bricks, made uh, from the soil of the site, and cured with a locally procured palm oil. Um, we, you know, we're really interested in, like, what's the carbon footprint of this building? This one will blow most projects out of the water, um, as far as, like, that's concerned, because, well, I'll show you in a minute, but, uh, like, the carbon footprint, so much of it has to do with labor as well, and, like, where that material is from, the whole cradle, the gate of what that material is. And we were, like, we really want to say, okay, of the total value of this project, I think you see the total construction value is about $350,000. You know, how much of that money are we going to place directly on site? How can we really track that? And from a material perspective, how are we going to source materials, right? So, yeah, 75% of the project came within 100 kilometers of Lima. So that's all the trees, all the dirt, all the, all the building. We had to import some cement, we imported tools, and we imported, like, nails and screws. That was it. And that had to come from, basically, Kinshasa. Uh, from a carbon footprint perspective, we worked with MIT to really do the, the math on this thing. And so Alima, uh, that's Congo, this is our other project in Rwanda that's done in a very similar fashion. And it's, it's like embarrassing how, like, how fractional it is compared to your global average when you just think about, this is the equivalent building of a 10 mile diet, you know. Um, and, and the construction industry used to be in that place and I think that's really where we're trying to figure out how do we get that back. Um, the next part of the wheel is through impact. Sorry. So this is the part where we can measure things, and this is the, the reporting. How do we prove that design matters? How do we prove that our decision had a tangible effect? Uh, and this is because we came from the world of doctors and, and NGO doctors. I have to go back to my funder and say, your $2 million achieved X. Here is my way of measuring that, you know? When have we ever had anything like that, except for the kind of versions of lead? So, um, you know, we, this, this project took us to Malawi. Uh, this is the kind of rural context of Malawi. You can see it's arid, smallhold farmers, uh, very not densely populated, very rural part of the world. And uh, a few years ago, the Ministry of Health had a policy, if it was your first, fifth, or more pregnancy, i.e. susceptible to complications, you were required to go to a district hospital to deliver. So the unintended consequence of that policy is this. You have people in their eighth month of their pregnancy, homeless, outside a hospital for a month or more, with not only them, but quite often at least one or two other people. So you basically have this massive population right outside the wall of the hospital, you know, cooking from wood-fired stoves, sleeping under a tree, susceptible to violence and rape. There, I mean, you could not have like, and, and this was sitting at the front door of the delivery of the, of the maternity ward. So the Gates Foundation, uh, brought us in to say, you know, we'd love you to help us figure this out. We have a design. Uh, we think we can do better. So this is the current design. It's in Area 25 outside the long way. It's basically the same floor plan as a hog barn. So um, I can't imagine that in your, you know, no one wants to spend a month in this room, let alone when you're eight months pregnant. So, uh, and, and as you can see, there's no space for their caregivers. So they're an externality on this plan. So we said, we'll do better, we'll take the same amount of money, and we will accommodate everybody, and we'll make it a better space. So we, we basically took the plan and disaggregated, blew it up, made a bunch of small little villages, they're coming from a kind of village structure more often than not, and create communities within communities, rooms of five, groups of 15, clusters of, of, of the grouping around the washroom and the shower, and in the middle, a kind of courtyard where they actually do uh, family planning. Uh, we used the structure uh, as a way to build in the extra space for all the other things they come. They're here. They're here for a month. They've got. They got. They have to store stuff. They need. They're buying food. They. 
their caregiver under somewhere to sleep at night. We make furniture into a bed that they can basically uh, have underneath the roof. We take the roof and we make it wider to not only is it hot to provide shade, collect water, but be that kind of like porch space during the day that they can get out and move around. It's kind of view of this, and I have to say, this visiting this project is for me our our, our best project to date because the users and having just had a child myself recently, and I, pregnant women are never want to sit down for more than five minutes at a time, constantly moving around to get comfortable, and the furniture of this project is a constant choreograph of yeah, very pregnant women. Um, our, our, our thesis, our question was like, okay, we have a control, we have this kind of standard, you know, uh, hog barn, and, and we have ours, and how can we prove that these are actually better? So we uh, worked, we got a grant, a research grant, and we put together a survey of both places with both users with basically the question of like, what the user, user satisfaction. So uh, administered through the, the midwives and the, the, the workers of, of these facilities that helped us basically interview people over two months, designed a survey that then went through, you know, how old are you, where are you coming from, did you attend school, you know, basic demographic profiling, um, and uh, pregnancy history. Uh, collected all of this into a massive spreadsheet to try to like find the golden answer. Very hard in qualitative analysis, for sure. But I think through this, uh, we, we did then follow that up with a bunch of interviews of the people that were there and the people that worked there. Brought this all together and like proud to say we got it to the Journal of Midwifery, that the findings were in the positive direction, however not completely conclusive. Because obviously, no woman had delivered and developed the real compared to each other. But um, moving in that direction. The last, uh, kind of last part of that wheel is the real kind of systemic change. So how can a building really make people think differently about something that has a broader system? And this project to me right now uh, uh, really resonates given what's going on in, Mo in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Um, in, the, in the wake of the earthquake, and this is in Port-au-Prince, uh, after the earthquake, you know, a whole flood of foreign aid came in. Rebuild Haiti, build back Haiti. Um, you know, quickly kind of dissipated. The thing that happened after the earthquake is, to, is, is the cholera outbreak. You know, basically people were homeless, living in tented structures. There was little by way of public, health, uh, public sanitation. And very soon um, there was an outbreak of cholera. I went into infectious diseases because I knew that they were the diseases that killed my people. I thought that this was a profession where you could actually do something. Breaking news out of Haiti, a massive catastrophic earthquake has struck the country. Tens of thousands of people. A couple hundred thousand dead. All that we have done within a few seconds were destroyed. Nine months after the earthquake, a new disaster in Haiti, an epidemic of cholera. 40,000 cases a day, up to 200,000 people. Yes, there was a big earthquake, and then this cholera hit, but they were completely unrelated. We need to hit cholera very hard. We need to make sure that the bacteria doesn't stay into our soil, into our water. Clearly, the infrastructure is key. There was always a sense that we could do better to create a structure that would be adapted to the needs of the people and that would have some kind of dignity that is fully patient. Development does not rely on your health. Economic opportunities and education are also essential. This is an evolution. An evolution positive. Uh, so as you can see, you know, we worked with Dr. Pop and a few of the people that were in the, in the, the trailer there. And the, the basic idea of this project is there was a vicious cycle of cholera in Porto Prince. You know, the treatment centers uh, that, that were being set up, they had, they, they had contracted these waste disposal teams to, to take the waste out of the treatment center, which is laced with cholera. And then they found that these waste disposal folks had nowhere to put it. They were driving it uphill miles outside of the time and dumping it back into the watershed. 
only then to come back down and affect the like poorest areas of the city. So this like cycle is just going and going and going. And that's like just public health catastrophe. We created a building that took the, the watershed out of the equation by collecting water to the middle of the building, so it's kind of really counterintuitive drain drain interior, to have a, a clean source of water, um, a cistern underneath it, and then all of the waste that was collected uh, from the patients is then put through this on-site filter bed into this uh, basically a kind of high-tech septic field. Thus, the color is not leaving the site. The entire system is closed. Um, we worked uh, with Herman Miller to design a better chair. If you've ever seen cholera, it's like the most undignified disease you can imagine. You're just losing liquid constantly. Uh, so we designed a chair that could easily be, more, be comfortable compared to the cots they had and be really easily removed and cleaned by the staff. Um, the, the building's kind of signature is this perforated metal panel that got its, uh, this is not a, like an exceptional bus, this is the normal bus. Um, we were really inspired by the metal work of Port au Prince and the kind of artistry and passion that's in it. And we found, you know, this beautiful uh, culture of, of, of craft around it where they, un they unfurl these oil barrels and make these beautifully ornate uh, kind of uh, punched, punched um, artwork. Um, so we found that Mackenzie and, and, and a few of his folks to basically take with us what could have been CNC'd up in Massachusetts. We designed the whole thing, Grasshopper, and said, what are we doing? Took the template, go, went down there, and had them hand, uh, hand, uh, hand cut all the panels. And that's the result, as you can see. These perforations kind of are, are sliding, you know, based on privacy and the amount of light and behind it, and they're colored to kind of give this, this project a beauty. Um, so I'll pivot from there and, and, and show a few of our, our more recent projects here that on a slightly different theme uh, completely, and they're around memorials uh, and and how we how we can design around uh, public public memory. So um, this uh, this is a memorial uh, in, in the South in, in Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, you know certainly since Charlottesville, I don't know how familiar with the, the news in the states, but this is the this is their good people on both sides part of the world. Um, that these memorials, which are increasingly coming under scrutiny, uh, that these are monuments and symbols that we have all around us, and uh, they they speak to a past. As we said, they either help or they hurt us. I think easy argument to say that these monuments to the Confederacy are not helping that country move on. Um, why, why are we working with memorials? And I think because they, they have such a profound ability to impact a society and make it look at itself differently and change, change that society. We got into this through a project in Rwanda, actually, our first, first project five years ago in this space. Uh, we were invited uh, to work on the uh, archive of the genocide, which um, the Kachasa courts that were set up after the genocide uh, had collected all this information, this incredibly transformative process of collecting stories from people and, and, and carrying out justice at a massive scale. Uh, and this building was to be the archive of that process. We, uh, as a design, we thought it was, it was important to take that, that traumatic event that, that killed millions and bring it back down to the kind of individual, the story that people had that are still repressed, that still had it inside of them. And one, make it a building that people could come and tell their story and document it if it hadn't already. So the base block is this small little interview room. We thought like this room needed to be connected to the sky, the space around it, to give people the sense of hope when they're in there, while they're kind of in this deep reflection. And then by multiplying these to really re represent the multitude of people that this, this traumatic event uh, in fact, uh, uh, affected. Um, and then this basically becomes the columns in the building block of, of the archive itself and builds out to be a library, an archive, a public center, a space for coming together and, and to understand this traumatic event of this, of this country's past. Um, these columns, as you can see, these, these confessionals just become the superstructure of the building and each of them coming up to the sky and you begin to, as you enter the building and go downhill, you can basically see the depth of the history of this event. Um, these spaces, some of the larger ones, are kind of lit, top lit by these spaces and really feel both the light of the hope and the kind of weight of this event that, that, that is very much with, with people and these spaces that people can come together and talk about it. Because healing is not, there's a traumatic event and it takes you know, eight years if not generations to really come to terms with it. So places to come and contemplate and, and discuss. And at, at night, 
this thing being this kind of beacon of, of not just a kind of traumatic past, but a, a hopeful future. Um, we partnered with McCaslin Associates out of London on this, and a couple years later, they said, that was great, let's, let's do something together again. So two years ago, the, uh, the UK had a, a competition for the Holocaust Memorial in the UK, right next to the House of Parliament. Um, this is our, our scheme, a intentionally kind of quiet scheme. If you've ever been to this park, just just south of Westminster, there's like a memorial to suffragettes. There's there's about there's there's nine memorials on the site, and we wanted to have a project that 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 was quiet and fit within them. David Aj wanted and he did the opposite. If you want to go look it up, um, we we were thinking, what is it about you know kind of this 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 event? Why a Holocaust memorial now? Like, what is it about a Holocaust memorial in the United Kingdom in 2017? And we. You know, we, we basically went and we, we talked to a prominent uh, rabbi in Camden and, and brought him into the team to think about what this needs to be at this point in time in Jewish society in the UK. And we developed this conversation and out of it we learned about this um, uh, tradition in Jewish culture to when you're visiting the grave of, your, of, of, of a deceased family member or, or of the dead, you leave a stone, you leave a token to say I was here on their tombstone. You don't leave roses, you leave a stone. What's interesting about this in Hebrew is the word for stone, Eben, when you when you decouple it and it becomes two things, it's also the word for father and son. So it, it has this kind of like connotation between the, the connection of generations and the learning between generations. So this this kind of powerful symbol for us was was a great way into the project. He said, you must also come with me to Poland. Come with me and see these sites. So uh, I didn't go. Thatcher, our filmmaker actually, who did the films you just saw, who's Jewish, and Michael went with them, and they traveled around Poland for a week at the you know January, best time to visit a, uh, visit this part of the world, and uh, visited Auschwitz, um, and toured around a few of them. And, and what what struck us, and probably is we've learned, is a very undocumented part of this history, is when you zoom out of the camp. Right next to quite a few of these is a quarry. The untold story is that the architect in this case, Albert Speer, who for the most part has got off scot-free in his complicity in the Holocaust, while designing the Third Reich's you know, uh, temples in Berlin, he was specifying marbles and granites from very specific quarries across Europe. So the role of the architect in this was directly linked. An idea about specifying a certain stone had a direct relationship with a genocide. So here are all the locations of concentration camps uh, uh, under the Third Reich across Europe. The ones we're really familiar with, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Birkenbau. Um, and if you, you, you pair this back and you look at where was the stone coming from of the construction of the, of the, of the Third Reich's uh, architecture. And they're in the same place, Buchenwald is a quarry. So this, this relationship, not just of the stone to, to Jewish culture, but of the stone to the, of the Holocaust itself and the role of design, we thought was a profound kind of discovery for, for how we could approach this. These quarries were, these were the labor camps. These people were put in these places. To, to mine out the marble and stone that would build this place. Um, this was called the stairway, I think, stairway to hell. Uh, and, and you can imagine you were lugging up pieces of stone, and when somebody under, the, under their like, fatigue or weight would fall, they would literally fall down the hill and just kill a million people as they came back down. And this still, the stone rests outside of Berlin in the kind of like depository of this, of this specification. It's a graveyard of architectural specification. So we thought, let's use that stone, let's use the tradition, and let's bring these together. Um, and, and, and for every person uh, that was killed in the, in, in the Holocaust, uh, they will be a stone. So instead of most memorials where you come and it's, and it's rest, and you visit it, uh, it's, it's set, you come and experience, this memorial was one of engagement. We wanted you to come and take that with you. That act of deciding, I'm going to take this with me, you're now part of that history, you've, you've chosen to recognize this event and you've chosen to be part of the reconciliation of that event. So over time, our hope was with the six million stones, you know, year by year the memorial would start to fade away and it would be 
its 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 lack of existence or its its kind of a disappearance would be would be the representation of the memorial itself. So people would come and visit and take it back to their home. You know, you'd have it on your mantle, you'd have it on your bookshelf. It would be part of your daily reminder of yes, I, I remember that now. Um, and the kind of view of, of what this place was when it starts out. And as it hollows out, it then forms a kind of amphitheater, a solemn space in the middle to come to. Um, and this, this, this quote by uh, Ellie Weissel here, so without memory, our existence would be barren and opaque, like a prison cell with no light. And any, if anything can, it is memory that will save us. So this, this is the, the purpose of memorialization, that it burns in our memory, that we have it there with us. Okay, Could you explain a little bit for the students or the audience uh, how your office started? Yeah. Like, uh, sure. you students, right? Yeah, so my, uh, basically my boss, uh, Michael, uh, the guy that gave the TED Talk, he, after his first year of grad school, he went and volunteered for Partners in Health. And he, he, he saw Paul Farmer give a lecture down the street, um, said, hey, uh, I'd love to come work with you. You're building all these hospitals around the world. Who's your architect? And, the, and Paul Farmer said, what do you mean architect? We, did, we draw these all ourselves, you know? So he's like, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll come and volunteer for you. So he went and volunteered for the summer, came back to start a second year of grad school. And in November, Paul called him up and said, hey, we have this project. Do you want to come help us design it? So it's totally preposterous to start <laughs> like design a hospital in your second year of grad school. Um, but that's how we got started. And basically, uh, Michael, a bunch of his classmates volunteered their time, moonlit while they were in the studio, designing this hospital on the side. Uh, took a year off school, moved to Rwanda bit by bit. And so that project then led to the other ones. And then eventually, it was like, oh, wow, we have an office here. So it's kind of doubled in size every year. Yeah, not typical. And if you ever find a client that would hire you, hire you when you're in school, you're doing well. <laughs> Um, I think there's quite a couple of people in the audience that are doing like projects uh, like in Tanzania or collaborating with Architects Without Borders or like yeah. uh, uh, other uh, contexts that we're not usually that we're not so used to. Mm. And I think that it was really nice to get some inspiration on how you work with it. But can you give them some tips on like okay, if you have the opportunity to go there? Because of course Congo, you can't always just you yeah. can't go everywhere. Yeah. Right. But if you have the opportunity to go, like what is... What do you do? What do you bring? <laughs> <laughs> or what do you take home? Maybe that's, maybe that's even better before yeah. you, when you were designing. Um, oh, that's an like, uh, like existential question, really. I think um, uh, over what duration of time? That's it, like a seven-week studio. I think what, what you bring is bring curiosity and bring humility as you would anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully you take away a perception. I mean, for me, in reflecting on my time, living in Rwanda for five years, uh, what I've taken away is a completely different perspective on what it means to be an architect. Because, you know, I was just saying, like, my, my first experience was the Munini Hospital, where it seems so fundamental, oh, we need a door. Uh, Oh, I have to design the door. Okay, I'm, I'm not just going to pick it out of the catalog, right? Or, okay, I got to do a detail. Who's going to make it? You know, like the fundamental questions that we have seemingly removed ourselves from, or we've been removed from, like that decision and that thinking about that door, and like where that door came from and who made it, is we need to think about that again because we we've been like through specification and through the disaggregation of the part of building. We don't know who made it, we don't know who it came from, we have no idea about that handle. Um, you know, what are we what are we dealing with, right? I think and I think that we, we think like the world how food culture has changed in the last decade. We need to we need we need to follow and we need to make up that ground very quickly so that we can be really conscientious about what we're doing. And in a place like Rwanda that's landlocked doesn't have a domestic construction industry really when we started. Like these were just like, we had to figure it out because there were no options. And I think in that scarcity, when you're, when you're, you have that many constraints, it really makes you think. Yeah. And um, it's, it's liberating. So that's what you bring back, or at least I have, yeah. Thank you.
I have one <coughs> yeah. technical question. Sure. Uh, about like what is the role of uh, what role does light play in your um, hospitals, for example? Yeah. Because, if I'm, because you you mentioned the uh, pineal sanatorium, but I'll put the board and mm. if I'm not really super mistaken that the sign driver behind that one is that light light is healing. Yep. Yep. But then I've been talking to my professor who says this is this is not true at all. <laughs> so <laughs> who are you talking to? <laughs> so I the I think I've I've I actually have gone to sanatorium in three weeks. I can't wait to go there, but pretty sure the sanatorium's wards are between twelve and fourteen meters wide. Munini, our typical plans, the building is 14 meters wide, exactly. Two meter corridor, 12 meters interior. That means no bed is further than six meters from a wall. Um, and everybody faces out. You can't double load. We built in kind of safeguards that ensures that you can't stack the hallway in a way that you're not gonna have that window. Um, and that's a technical way of saying, like, light's super important. I, like, you, having daylight, having a view outside when you're bedridden, you know, is the one thing that's going to help your psychology. And in Bataro, when we compared Bataro to another hospital, and we, th I, I would want to go back and t hopefully we can get the permission of the Ministry of Health to actually measure things like light levels and oxygen levels would be the two easy things to measure in a room to show that airflow is working and that there's enough natural light, um, and, and compare that with patient recovery times. It's a study we've been trying to trying to get their permission to do. They're reluctant to because. It cracks the door open at these other hospitals aren't very good, you know. But yes, like it's 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 a fundamental part of what makes us happy and helps our like helps our health is light, you know. I mean, I was just I'm living in Copenhagen right now, and yesterday on my bike home, people are literally sitting on the asphalt facing west, you know, just taking on sun because I mean, for obvious reasons, it helps you, you know. So, I don't know who your professor is, but... <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about it from a, like a clinical perspective as well. Yeah. We would use the light to, for example, uh, reduce the amount of germ, germs in a... Well, so from an infection control point, we the kind of lowest tech way of doing it is a um, ultraviolet. It's like a little ultraviolet um, light that's above the bed. Mm -hmm. So, our, again, the wards that we've designed, there's... Electricity is seldom, like, you don't have a lot of it, right? So we wanted to make sure there's enough buoyancy in the room so that the room can self-ventilate. So your body's giving off, we've worked quite a bit with a really good mechanical engineer of how much heat is coming off the body. So there's natural buoyancy above the patient, right? Which is good because if they're infected, they're, the air coming off of them is naturally going up to the ceiling. And then new air is going to come underneath them just from the negative pressure. So you put a UVGA light above the bed, and it's shining up ultraviolet light at the ceiling. You don't see it with your eyes; it would hurt you. And that basically is that air is going up. That UVGA just basically is killing uh, the bacteria, or basically everything that's coming out of your breath is getting kind of eradicated above the bed in these simple little cheap lights. That instead of you know the square plan of you know, healthcare in my mind, that square plan says to me, mechanical engineers have won the war. Like, and we're not, or worse, they've, they're like, they're the foot, like the Honeywells of the world, or the, I don't know who the big HVAC companies of, you know, that who's winning the battle. Like, how do we sell a, as much mechanical equipment as possible? People must only breathe through HEPA filters. You know, every hospital I've been to in this part of the world, you can't even open the, the window. If you can, you can open it like maybe an inch, you know. That's ridiculous. So we have interference with the carefully balanced uh, pressure in each room. But that's but you could design for that. Yeah. Nightingale didn't have HVAC. So, you know, we've we've over time we collectively have designed ourselves into hermetic boxes, which are hospitals the most expensive, most energy intensive buildings, and probably the least enjoyable to spend time in. So from it, like it seems like we've designed ourselves into a dead end. That's my take. Not all the projects. I've seen some good ones. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm pretty sure there is a lot of questions, and if you have more questions, maybe we can come down, and then everyone who needs to go back to uh, their lecture. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.